Um, Bob, as many of you from Colorado know, and many of you outside of Colorado, uh, Bob is a three-term, I believe three-term congressman. Uh, the only reason he didn't do a fourth, fifth, or sixth term, or probably as many as he wanted, was because he had made a three-term pledge to his, uh, well, three-term pledge to his constituents and to his family. And uh, when he was nearing the end of that third term, President Bush 43 um, had a visit with Bob, and it was explaining to him why that even though he had made that pledge, it would it would be a good idea to go ahead and seek that fourth term anyway. And Bob Schaefer, being the man of principle that he is, and if you go through the leadership program, you will learn what a man of principle he is, looked the president in the eye and said, but Mr. President, if I break that pledge, how am I going to look my children in the eye? Because I made that pledge. So without further ado, I would like to introduce one of my personal inspirations, and I know one of Rick's uh, inspirations is Bob Schaefer. Wow. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, hiding behind you. <laughs> thank you for that nice introduction, Jennifer. I, uh, I, I heard uh, yesterday's, um, uh, yesterday's presentations were just outstanding, and I'm sorry I missed them. I, uh, in, in addition to being a has-been congressman, I, uh, you know, I ran for the U.S. Senate, and I, I like telling, explaining it this way to the kids at my school, because they always ask, you know, would you ever run for the United States Senate again? I ran in 2008, and they, uh, they ask if, I, you know, if, I'd, if I'd give that another try, and I say, well, no, I, I, you know, I wish I was there, obviously, right now. I wish I was running for re-election right now, but, um, uh, but you know, I ran in 08, and the voters decided I should be principal of Liberty Common High School instead. So that's why, I, why I'm there. And so I, we had a back-to-school event last night. In fact, uh, Sheriff Smith from Larimer County was our keynote speaker, so he, uh, I, I, you know, I guess he's got some little thing that allows him to get up here faster than I can. And so uh, as, uh, as the sheriff, uh, of course, if I'd have, knew he knew, if I'd have known he was, uh, when he was traveling, I'd have got here right behind him. But, uh, at any rate, anyway, so, uh, so our event um, ended last night. One thing I got to announce, and I'm going to brag about it because I got a microphone and I'm here, but uh, <laughs> right here, but and, and a principal of a charter public charter high school. The um, so and uh, last year my my seniors, uh, they, every junior in the state of Colorado takes the ACT, and so my juniors last year took it. Um, and uh, scored the number one composite score in the state last year, and so uh, just, yeah, can't can't uh, can't beat that. Well, hold your applause because because uh, my incoming seniors they took the test last year as juniors, and those results just came in, and they're number one in the state again. So it's not a fluke. It's not a fluke. So um, so those kinds of things make me a believer in things like choice and being able to uh, apply market principles to things like education. And so that's somewhat of the topic uh, that we're going to discuss today. You know, it, inevitably, it's um, it, it, just since I guess since the founding of civilized uh, governments and governing institutions, uh, the topic of this next debate has been kicked around, and that is, do we achieve um, higher quality and low cost and great convenience through the efficiency of, of uh, centralization, centralized authority, or do we uh, achieve those goals through uh, decentralization? Uh, that's true with healthcare. It's true with everything you've discussed at the conference today, and it's also true with education. And it really is the centerpiece of today's today's debate. Um, you know, obviously uh, we had 13 states when the country started out, and there are 13 different approaches to public education as the country expanded. Every state had its own approach to public education, and there are successes and there are failures that uh, exist within that kind of a, a kind of a structure. And within the state of Colorado, there are 178 school districts. And should they all be managed in a similar way, or should they be decentralized to achieve whatever goals are established locally? And so, in all of these questions, it's a particular dilemma for conservatives. And the track record on this is not particularly clear to give us any any guidance. Uh, you know the. Uh, conservative presidents that we probably would celebrate in this room are the architects of a plan to approach education in a more centralized view, to try to establish national goals, to establish a list of things that all children in America should know before they graduate from high school. I remember when I was in the state legislature and Bill Owens became governor, conservative governor, had a business background and a conservative track record. His question was, well, now that I'm governor and it's my responsibility to improve education in the state, how am I going to do this? And as most business-oriented people would do, uh, first, first we're going to start taking measurements. We're going to measure all 178 school districts. And what are we going to measure them against? 
a common set of goals so that we know whether District A is competing well against District B and we can figure out which ones are down at the bottom. But in order to do this, we have to have a common set of, of objectives, right? I mean, this makes good business sense. Why wouldn't it make good sense for a state or for a country? And so we have 50 states who for years have established different goals academically for their states. You know, we compete against one another there. You can tell whether Colorado does well against Massachusetts, let's say. Uh, but um, the curriculum in Massachusetts for years has been different than the curriculum in Colorado. And we just expect politicians as they come and go, and members of the boards of education as they come and go, to uh, reference their goals against one another. Well, a bunch of governors got together uh, about seven or eight years ago and said, well, why don't we develop a curriculum as governors for the entire country? And it would be at the option of states whether they want to adopt that curriculum as their state curriculum. And that became known as the Common Core Standards, the subject of today's, today's discussion. And we've got two experts who are going to talk through uh, a number of things. I'll moderate the debate, and we're going to talk about what is the Common Core. Is it fundamentally a good idea? And whether it's a good idea is a function of two things, the quality of the standards themselves, and the process itself is relevant to the discussion and to the debate today as well. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll dive into both, both of those. Uh, first is one of the people who stood up in the room, Laura Boggs. She's a graduate of the leadership program of the Rockies. And in 2009, she got herself elected to the Jefferson County Board of Education. It's one of the largest uh, school districts in, in the country. I think it's 35th, if I remember right. And, um, and, and, and so a, a, perfect, uh, a, a perfect example for us to discuss and consider as we discuss the uh, impact of the Common Core curriculum, Common Core uh, standards. Um, excuse me, uh, standards here in, uh, in Colorado. Uh, Laura um, is a uh, University of Michigan grad in business administration and she, uh, her experience and background as she's applied it to education comes from the business world and the business community. Uh, so uh, Laura, why don't you come on up and, and uh, there she is right there. There's four chairs. Why don't, why don't you two sit in the middle? I'll sit over. Is, is this scripted anyway? Is there? You, you have a preference? Okay. Why don't, why don't you sit in the middle? I'll sit over there then. Good. Good. Next is Jim Sturgios. Uh, I met Jim uh, about a year ago uh, when the Common Core debate really started uh, escalating and becoming a little more controversial than it had been when the state of Colorado initially adopted it. Uh, Jim is uh, uh, the executive director of the Pioneer Institute. And uh, he has been spending the last couple of years traveling around the state and organizing efforts to inform legislators, uh, members of the State Board of Education, and the public generally about uh, the Common Core curriculum from his perspective. So just to uh, tell you how these things line up, Jim is not in favor of the Common Core standards, and Laura is. And so we will ask these two uh, individuals and experts as we uh, go through. Uh, to justify their, their positions and obviously attempt to persuade the room. So uh, uh, Jim, uh, in addition to being executive director of the, the Pioneer Institute, uh, carries a, a PhD from Boston University, and so we are glad that he has made the trip all the way to Colorado once again, Jim Sturgios. So Jim, welcome. Thank you. Well, I've given a little bit of a, a cursory description of where the Common Core came from. It uh, was a, a, a collective effort of a number of uh, chief state school officers and governors throughout, uh, throughout the country that came together and said, let's come up with some standards. But the real question is what, happened, what happens next? Jim, why don't we start with you? Why don't you add a little background to uh, the Common Core? We'll, we'll talk uh, about, you know, well, I'll let you explain to the, to the, to the crowd where they came from and then um, the obvious next question is, are they good? Absolutely. Well, first I would just want to say I believe what, what uh, Jennifer believes and I believe what Rick believes and I think we all do. And I think one of the things that um, Bob was just talking about a second ago was the fact that Common Core is a debate that we can have in a civil way. We can disagree. Uh, you can be a Republican, you can be a conservative, you can believe in limited government and also believe in it. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, but that's okay. <laughs> um, look. There are several things that are probably worth making note of just to start, to set the table. Uh, it is argued that Common Core is a set of state standards. Uh, and as Bob said, in part, uh, tr uh, it's accurate to say that some governors got together and said they wanted to develop common standards across states. Fact is, 
uh, it was not truly driven by governors. It was driven by a chief incorporated group in Washington, Washington D.C. together with the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers, the, uh, the representative organization of the commissioners of education in various states, uh, and the lobbying arm of the National Governors Association. And to say that the governors were deeply involved in this is just not accurate, first thing to say. Second thing to say is in terms of are they truly state standards, let me, let me give you an example of the kind of public input that goes into creating state standards. I think many of you will know this from your own participation. I'll give you from Massachusetts. Uh, and Massachusetts, I think, is something of a bellwether to take a look at because we are the only state in the country that is truly internationally competitive. We're in the top six countries in the world in math and science. We participated most recently, a year and a half ago, as a country. Uh, we are the top in the country. We've gone from about just above mid-range in terms of performance on the national assessments that already exist to number one. We've been there since 2005. We take this stuff seriously. Standards is a big piece of what we do. Not the only thing we do, we do a lot of charter schools and other things as well. But when you think about whether these are truly state standards, when we developed our state standards on in, in English, math, history, and science, it took us six years comprehensively to do it. These were public debates. They're debates where parents and teachers and business folks and university scholars got together and said, let's have this big debate. Can you imagine the debate on US history? Incredibly controversial. How do you teach the Civil War? War of Northern aggression? <laughs> you know, how do you teach these things? And same thing in math. They call, you've heard of the math wars. Do you use a constructivist approach? Do you add using the standard algorithm or do you add three digit numbers, 150 and 175, starting with the hundreds column, or do you start with the, the single digit column? These are all wars that happened. They were in the front page of the newspaper public comment, revisions, public comment, hearings. That didn't happen with the Common Core Standards. There was a small group of folks who sat together. Yes, there were some bureaucrats from, from Massachusetts. I would think probably from Colorado. I most recently heard when I was in Indiana. They said, yes, yes, two of our bureaucrats participated in this. OK, <laughs> what about the parents? What about the teachers? What about the teachers? What about the scholars and the business interests? Is that a true state process, state-led process? No, what happened was the final draft of the Common Core Standards was finalized on June 2nd, 2010. There were $4.35 billion in federal funding available if you did a few things and most notably adopted Common Core and promised to adopt one of the consortia national tests. Um, that's not a state-led process from my perspective at all, and I do think that state processes and upholding the public trust is incredibly important. Having these conversations is incredibly important. If we're not going to argue in the front pages of our newspapers, in public, disagreeing agreeably or disagreeably about what our kids are going to learn, what the heck are we doing? So Jim, let me uh, cut you off there and yep. we'll get to the uh, other aspects of it. But, um, the, uh, and, and by the way, as a matter of full disclosure, the Colorado State Board of Ed, when I, I was chairman of the state board for seven years and uh, just stepped down last January uh, my, when my term ended, uh, the State Board of Education voted on whether to adopt these Common Core standards. It passed on a four to three vote. I was one of the three that voted against, so I, so I, I don't come here with a neutral opinion, um, but I, 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 I will do my best. To, I, I will be fair about this. I will cut you off, Jim. <laughs> Just like the best of them, but the, the so but the question is um, the point I want to get to is the state of Colorado by their elected officials did in fact adopt these these standards at some point even though they may have been drafted by others that people we can't uh, name easily. Um, uh, our we know who these people are. We know those seven elected officials and our legislators who, um, as an elected body, ended up adopting uh, or supporting the adoption of these standards in a variety of ways. Um, at some point, you, could, you, could, you can see these standards being developed, you can get a sense for their quality, and the state makes a collective decision to stay in or stay out. And so let me get to that point, Laura. Do you, uh, are you satisfied that uh, the state is moving toward and embracing Common Core standards with eyes wide open? Um, thanks for the question, and I'll remind you we're both from Cincinnati, so you have to be nice to me. <laughs> Go Reds. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that um, the way you started appropriately, I think, is to congratulate your students. And I, 
and your teachers and staff on your ACT performance. But to me, that speaks to the issue here. If we didn't have standardized tests in that ACT, you couldn't compare yourself to other schools across the state, and more importantly, to other schools across the nation. So before I answer your question with all due respect, I want to know a little bit about who's here. How many of you are from Colorado? OK. Texas? Where else? OK. All right. Um, OK. And how many of you went through public schools? Grandchildren in public schools? Awesome. And, and what is the belief system about public education in the United States? To me, this is an incredibly important conversation because we live in a republic, as we were reminded a couple of times this weekend, not in a democracy. And if our students don't have the skills to read their ballots, to think deeply, to what my grandmother would call a bullshit detector for what's on your ballots. Thank you, Grandma. Um, then we don't have the continuation of our republic. So for me, the Common Core state standards are that. And as Congressman Schaefer knows well, in Colorado, we did go through that very public process. Colorado, before the governors got together, was already saying, we have an industrialized model of education that is no longer appropriate for our children. In the industrial age, our children graduated, went to work in the industry. They needed to know lots of facts. That's not true anymore. Most of our students will have six or seven careers, not just jobs. We don't know what the careers our children will have are. So we need our children to have a narrower set of standards, but a much deeper understanding. The old standards in Colorado were very broad and not very deep. So Colorado was already in this process. We had already, as I understand, developed standards not just in English language arts and math, but in 13 different areas. And you can go to the Colorado Department of Education with people that Congressman Schaefer hired, and you can see the standards in dance and in visual arts, in addition to reading, writing, and math. And I am told that many of our citizens engaged in that process of comparing what the other governors thought was a floor, not a ceiling, but a floor of what all students should know. Because at the end of the day, especially as Republicans or conservatives, don't we want to know how effectively our dollars are spent? So we've heard a couple times this weekend we need to tell a story, and this is the story I'll tell before I turn it back to Congressman Schaefer. How many of your children took Spanish or French or German? How many of you took Spanish or French or German? If you had walked into a Spanish class knowing a couple words, I know agua, I can say gracias, I know a couple. If you had come out after a year's worth of studying Spanish one, and only knew five words, would you consider that year an effective use of your time in learning a new language? To me, thank you, no, <laughs> no, good. Anybody else, yes? Five words, good for anybody? OK. To me, if we don't have some common set of standards that we measure the effectiveness against, how do we know when those lovely things of innovation and capitalism are working. How do we know? So here's some agua. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive right into the, the standards as well. Are, are the standards reasonable objectives for the state to, to pursue? Uh, Laura, you want to take a crack at that first? And um, kind of switch sure, the I'll, ta I'll take a crack at that. Um, I, I think that's a discussion we all need to have. For me as a base, are they reasonable? Absolutely. So let's see. Fifth grade math, numbers and operations in base 10. Recognize that in a multi-digit number, a digit in one place represents 10 times as much as it represents in the place to its right, and one-tenth of what it represents in the place to its left. Yeah, I want children to understand base 10 math. But that's a base. I'm not saying that's where the ceiling needs to be. I'm saying that when we invest in public education, that we need an understanding of what all of our students are expected to learn, or at least the preponderance, 
here's where the measure should be. And yes, I believe that in math and English language arts, with the caveats of how they've been written, they're very reasonable base standards. Jim, are the standards reasonable and uh, um, look, something that I come satisfies at this, the parents? I come at this with a little bit of a, a unique perspective. Um, the, um, I, I have experience in talking about foreign languages. I speak uh, four languages. Uh, I am a kind of a language nut, uh, one of which is uh, Japanese. And I, I ran a prep school in Japan, so I have a very good idea of what international competitive, competitiveness means to these folks, OK? Um, and develop curriculum for that school as well to understand how to get them to where they wanted to get. Um, these were students who wanted to come to the United States and study at the highest levels, OK? So first thing I, I would say is, the same discussion that we had before about rule of law, about encroachment, federal encroachment, these are all important discussions to have, and we should have them. But the quality is the thing that, that, that matters most to us in Massachusetts, because it's been the lifeblood that has led to our very fast increases in performance. Um, second thing I'd note is that standardized tests, I completely agree, we've been big proponents of standardized tests. In Massachusetts, we're the only state in the country that actually has a state test that correlates well with the existing national assessments. There are existing national assessments. They're sampled. They give us an ability to say Colorado's here, Massachusetts here. They're also larger city-based, so you can actually compare Boston to other larger cities like Denver. Um, I'd say that when we looked at this issue, we looked at it in a very deep way. Jim Milgram was the only academic mathematician who, that is truly an, a, a mathematician, not an educationista, who does math, okay? He was the only a academic mathematician on the validation committee for Common Core. So he went in thinking, if these are really high quality standards, I'll support them. Sandra Stotsky, who's known around the country as the, the best uh, academic expert, the most highly reputed academic expert in English language arts, helped develop some of the best standards in the country in the, in the, in the various states. She sat on the validation committee. She, too, believed if the national standards were good enough, she would support them. So it's not an ideological question in this regard. Both of them stepped off the validation committee saying, this is a bloody mess, or I won't use your term about um, their, uh, their detectors went up. Uh, um, and here are the reasons why. Um, when you take a look at uh, some of the standards, you can see that it cuts. Colorado's ELA standards, for example, are rich in literature. Massachusetts are as well. Common Core cuts the amount of literature in half. There are 10 standards for nonfiction, nine for liter literary study. Anybody who knows anything about reading research and writing research knows that the acquisition of a deep, broad vocabulary is the, those are the keys to the kingdom to be truly capable of analytic thinking, what some people call critical thinking. Uh, so you're going to cut that, especially in K through 8, where it's absolutely necessary. And a narrative, as we all know from the research, narratives are incredibly important to keep children engaged. And what you're going to give them is an EPA regulation. You're going to have them study an extract this big on a frog and keep their interest. That's not how kids' minds work. We know that. Okay? On the math side, Jim Milgram has written and has submitted to Common Core and also before the Colorado Board of Education uh, testimony saying that Common Core pushes back academic expectations in math to the point where by fifth grade we're one year behind our international competitors and by seventh grade two years behind folks. Algebra 1 moves to ninth and tenth grade from eighth grade for many, many, many states. All right, let me ask you something. What does all that translate into? The guy who wrote the math standards for Common Core, a guy named uh, Jason Zimba, Dr. Jason Zimba from Bennington College, he's now left. He's a wonderful guy, warm guy, I like him. But he's wrong-headed, this, this is a question about ideas. He testified in front of the Massachusetts Board of Education, he said, when the question was posed to him, what level of college readiness are you talking about? What do you mean by college readiness? When you're saying Common Core will get you to be college ready, he said, non-selective community in state colleges is all. And I ask you, if we're going to give up on the rule of law, and I can talk you through exactly why that is not a, just a constitutional question. If we're going to spend about 16, 17 billion dollars as a set of states, unfunded mandate to do this, it better be better than community college readiness for my kids. And I would say one final thing, and that is regard to the floor versus, is, is this a floor? Can we do more than that? Look, folks. Common Core sets out in the initial agreements with states 
85% verbatim your state standards have to reflect. Verbatim, reflect Common Core. The national consortia tests, there are two consortia building tests that would be across the various states. Those tests will only test what's in Common Core. You can add more literature, you can add better math, you can specify very specific Colorado standards or Massachusetts standards. And guess what, it won't be tested. And if it's not tested, guess what? It will not be taught long term. All right, so this is a grand fiction that we all at the state level have lots of flexibility. Let me remind you, the government, when it encroaches, it encroaches. So let me uh, challenge Jim. The, yep. uh, your tradition in Massachusetts, I mean, my goodness, the, uh, the, the pillars of American literature, uh, half of them come from your state. And uh, your uh, the best the, ones, the, the best ones. Okay, and, and the and, and I and I could see where the uh, the affinity of um, ma the Massachusetts Board of Education for uh, strong literature uh, might take a particular direction just based on the history and uh, culture of, of your state. Um, everybody here would, of course, argue that uh, of the virtues of cowboy poetry would, would rival <laughs> would rival those of of uh, these great Massachusetts authors, and we may have. A, a different direction for the state of Colorado. But can you address Laura's point of, of, of should not we be able to look across the country and, and have our children um, uh, coast to coast aspiring to similar or identical standards in English language arts and math? Um, wouldn't it be, you know, the, I mean, the case being, and this is the point of both sides of, uh, or the, the pro side of, of the debate, is that some level, so, some common standard would be better than, as Arne Duncan said, 50 states going their own direction. See, I disagree. This is a very controlling sort of top-down approach to thinking about education. I think you shouldn't study all Massachusetts literature. You should study Colorado literature. You should get to know the place, affinity to your place, to your parenthood, to your traditions. It's really important. Massachusetts has great literature, but guess what? Alabama has awesome literature. Louisiana has incredible literature. Texas has incredible literature. I mean, when you think about books like The Movie Goer and things like that, what they meant for the culture of the 1960s and 70s, that's not Massachusetts, and they should absolutely study it. That is grafting our kids, gluing our kids to history and understanding where they came from, and I think that is incredibly important. Now, can you get to some level of common standard? You know, it's a, the question I would ask is, why would you have to? We already have a national assessment based upon sampling. We understand where Massachusetts is compared to various states. There are all kinds of difficulty analyses that assessment gurus can do to understand whether Massachusetts state <coughs> test is actually reflective of a standard similar to NAEP, which is a national sample test currently. Same thing for Colorado. You could do the same thing for a district if you wanted to. The fact is people are damn lazy. They don't want to do their jobs and do the hard work and talk about this stuff in public because guess what? People disagree about it. My God. Again, I would just say we really have to go back and say this is worth arguing about. Our kids are worth arguing about. This is not a technical issue. And I would take exception with the view that somehow we're in a different world today where careers are so different and everything's so different that um, you know, it's kind of processing information. We have information at our fingertips. No, education is about knowledge, folks, about judgment. If you want to process information, it it means you have to go out and you have to go and understand what are reputable sources, not on the basis of who tells you what a reputable source is. The New York Times, by the way, is a vendor to Common Core. So I'm, I'm sure they're going to support it. And nothing gets, I read the New York Times every day, nothing against that. <laughs> but I'm like, I want to know, do you know, understand how to do analyses? Can you think analytically, not just process information? And that means being glued to a heritage and a way of thinking as well. So, I would not say that you have to have that across the board. Here's what I would say, and I don't mean to go long, I apologize for that. If the federal government, and I may get booze on this, okay? <laughs> if the federal government, which is very good at spending money, want to do something useful, okay? If you think about the federal government's involvement in education over the years, uh, it's the, the uh, 1965 act that established a role for the federal government said that the, the, uh, the federal government cannot have anything to do with curriculum development, testing development, instructional practice guides. The 1979, that was signed by Lyndon B. Johnson, by the way. 1979, Jimmy Carter signed a law establishing the Department of Education, said this very same thing. Every law, major law, that is part of the Elementary Secondary Education Act, which is the law that gets reauthorized most recently as No Child Left Behind, states explicitly the federal government should have no truck whatsoever with supervising, directing, having any involvement with curriculum development, testing for states, and 
instructional practice guides. They blow past all that, but the biggest point about the program is in their involvement over 40 years, they've had no real positive effect on education. They ran the DC schools for a while, look at what they did there, okay? So I guess what I'd say to you is, you can do better. Colorado standards were better in ELA prior to Common Core. They could be better, go back and do the hard work. Your math standards, to my understanding, looking at them, they were about as good as Common Core, maybe a little bit worse than Common Core. So let's all look at ourselves honestly, and not say Common Core's the devil. We should go back and make them better. Uh, Laura, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, the, the duties and challenges of any elected official in, when it comes to education, because um, you can turn on C-SPAN and watch late night speeches of members of Congress holding up uh, the uh, Tim's comparison, third international math science study comparison of states, or of countries. Um, PISA studies, the other one, I don't remember what that stands for. Uh, but we are constantly looking at and being confronted with where we rank as a country uh, compared to others and where, and where we rank as a state compared to, to others and the goal of elected officials, you know, you get elected for a short term, you're you gotta come up with some strategy by the time you, you are finished or you wanna get reelected to show how you've made progress. Um, can you speak to that, to the, I mean, you, you spoke already to the, um, the, the values of having a common set of standards around the country for uh, the purpose of state to state comparison. Um, what's your view on, on Common Core's utility in helping us uh, become more internationally competitive? Um, well, I think that's a great question um, because the U.S. does rank 14th in reading right now and 25th in math. And the Common Core state standards allow us to at least begin the conversation. So one of the things I didn't say in the introduction is my mother was a public school teacher and she taught English, so I'm all over that Shakespeare stuff. <laughs> <laughs> as I sat at her knees as she graded papers, she taught mostly in the inner cities in Cincinnati. So here's the conversation for me. Today, in Colorado, less than 50% of our 10th graders are proficient in math. Many of our third graders, something like 30% of our third graders aren't proficient in reading. The problem that we all have, and I think Congressman Beaupre would agree, is my mother's $5 word, cognitive dissonance. Is there anybody in here who would stand and say, I sent my children to a lousy public school? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. I gotta tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you should. You should, especially if you're in Colorado. And you guys do wonderfully well. However, 50% of our children in Denver don't graduate from high school. I'll talk about Jefferson County. We are an affluent county. We compare ourselves to Douglas County and Cherry Creek all the time. But because we're such a large district, bordering on Sheridan, on the east side, all the way through Evergreen and Conifer on the west side, it's like running multiple districts. Because you take those children between the Sheridan and now almost Kipling corridor, we have a high school in Jefferson County where 96% of our 10th graders, what number was that? 96% of our 10th graders are not proficient in math. For five years in a row. We graduate 70% of those kids. 71% of them need remediation. They're not on the list of the turnaround schools in the state of Colorado. If we don't have some base level of measurement, my superintendent and my union boss bot buddies on our school board get to run around telling you all how great things are in Jefferson County. And there is no evidence to the contrary. Truly not true, I just gave you some. But I can't tell you how my high schools in Jefferson County compare to the high schools in Massachusetts. Yes, we take NAEP tests across the state, but until they get to 10th grade and they take an ACT test, which all other students across the states take, there is no measure for how are our third graders doing compared to the third graders in Massachusetts? Fourth grade, yes, for NAEP, but it's a randomized sample. It doesn't go down to the school level. 
We have 178 school districts in the state of Colorado, as you mentioned. 100 of them have under 100 kids. How many of those school districts don't get in that statistical sampling of NAEP? Yes, Common Core State Standards, all of those words are important. They're a core, they're state-based, they're common. It gives us the ability to start to break the cognitive dissonance. To John Caldera's point earlier, it's not gonna get fixed tomorrow. But if you guys don't walk out of here knowing that your children aren't in the best public schools possible, we can't fix it. Uh, Jim Lohr raises a good point. Let's stipulate Massachusetts has good schools. Shouldn't a parent in Jefferson County be able to be armed as an active and engaged citizen with some comparable data as to how their, that, that parent's high school is comparing to one in your state? And then uh, let me add, and then a second issue I'd like you to address is this international comparison. The, the motive, the, the, the argument that typically propels the pro Common Core side is that America is slipping behind our internet, their, our kids are slipping behind their international peers, and we need to be more, more competitive in a changing economy. So those no, two issues, great, great Compar questions. comparison at the state level, or at a district-to-district district level, even across state lines, and comparison between Colorado kids and kids in Japan, let's say. Yep. Um, so let me start with um, federal involvement has not really raised the standards over the con in, in, across the states over the last uh, 12, 13 years. If you take a look at the history of the standards movement, which is probably about a 20, 25-year movement, it started after a nation at risk when Ronald Reagan's uh, then Secretary of Education said, you know, we're, ex we're essentially waging war on ourselves because of the quality of our schools. We're undermining our ability to compete com uh, economically and our ability to defend ourselves. Um, in the 1990s, a lot of states really worked very hard on this, Texas, Massachusetts, any number of states. Um, early 90s, the standards were very weak. By the late 90s, they were very good. There was really not much federal involvement at all in any of this. They were just folks who were sharing information across states. Uh, NCLB comes, and guess what happens? States don't want any kind of accountability, so they lower their standards and they lower their, the quality of their tests. Um, so what we do now is because of the federal involvement, which has led to some adverse impacts, we say what will solve this is more federal involvement. I find that a remarkable leap of logic. I also think that uh, what uh, Laura is arguing is essentially Colorado has an issue with proficiency in a number of its schools. We must do something. Feds, please help. I'm going to be, let me say this respectfully but firmly. You have the evidence you need to know which schools are not proficient. You just gave it to us. The hard work must be done to address those. That should be a turnaround school. And that decision should be made, and that's where the focus should be, not on some ethereal set of standards that will uh, be incorporated across any number of uh, states. Look, um, in Massachusetts, frankly, we don't look when we think about policy, we're thinking about my town of Brookline. We look at, oh, the next town over at Newton has better scores than us. What the heck are they doing? They'll go over there and they'll share information, all that sort of stuff. It happens across our state. It happens regionally to some extent. We don't look at Colorado, not because Colorado is not a great state. It's a great state. But it's not like we have to know exactly what happens in that district to understand what we should do. Folks, education is, has traditionally been local for a pretty good reason. T.S. Eliot used to talk about in his notes on culture how meaningful action, reasonable action by a human being is best when it's closely held in an environment that you know well. It is absolutely true. Taking some reform that's off the shelf in Brookline, Massachusetts, because you think it might work in Colorado, ignores all the cultural, important cultural stuff you have here. It ignores the differences among kids. Kids are really unique. So I would say you have all the information you frankly need right now. You need the courage to act upon it. So. Thank you. I hope you empowered every Coloradan to go out and vote for their right school board representatives in the next 65 days. Absolutely. <laughs> it is so important. And these are races that get ignored a lot of the time. People are thinking about the top of the ticket. In Massachusetts, our, we have a terrible Republican culture where everyone thinks about the governor's office, and we win that often, but no one thinks about the grassroots, roots, what's happened to the school committee, the board of education, any of that sort of stuff. 
So in Colorado, our school board elections are actually odd year elections and in November. So raise your hand again if you live in Colorado. <laughs> Vote. <laughs> in about 60 days, you'll get a mail-in ballot in your mailboxes. If you're not on the ballot, which you have this week to go pick up your petitions and get on the ballot, know who is and vote. But with all due respect, I'm not asking the federal government to come help us. That's not what I perceive Common Core state standards to be. I am asking us to be able to compare how our children do in our schools to how they do in Massachusetts. Not at a ceiling level, but at a base level. Because we spend in Colorado somewhere around ten dollars or $11,000 per student, we've asked ourselves all weekend, why are we in this position? Why in Colorado are we leaning blue, a blue state, wherever you think we are? Because we have ignored our public education systems. My grandmother also taught me, if I don't own the problem, I can't fix it. I'm not asking the feds to ride in on a white, white horse and help us fix this. I'm asking us, is this the base we want? And we should be able to compare. In 1785, John Adams said, the whole people must take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expense of it. That's what we've decided in the United States so that we can graduate a literate constituency. If we don't have the ability to compare that across the states, we'll be back here 10 years from now, 20 years from now, asking ourselves why we're getting progressively more liberal, because we've allowed our union bosses to take over. Any totalitarian takeover, any socialistic takeover, any communistic takeover knows, get the kids, and you have the country. It's time for us to stand up and make sure that doesn't happen. I'm going to move some of the questions into, uh, into uh, going forward, or considering going forward. Uh, the reality is that the state of Colorado committed to the Common Core standards before the, while they were still being um, uh, completed. Um, it, it wasn't the case with the, you know, the, help, the, the famous Nancy Pelosi line where she's standing, you know, we'll read the bill after we pass it. It wasn't exactly like that. They were in progress while the state was considering uh, voting on them, and uh, the state board anyway. And so we had some general guidelines and some very specific examples we could look at, but they weren't fully completed and implemented when Colorado um, joined. And the, and the same can be said with these international consortia. Um, there is now a, um, there are, there are two national groups that states can join for the sake of assessment. So follow me on this. There's the standards we're talking about now. An important part of this is the assessment to those standards, and you can join one or two groups. We joined one called PARC, uh, as the, the state legislature passed a law in 2012, um, causing the state board to pick one or the other, and the state board picked, picked PARC. Um, but the question is, as the, and, and, and the park standards are not developed even now. Right. And so we've committed ourselves financially as well as uh, in terms of state planning uh, to these, these initiatives. And the comfort that ha is constantly given to elected officials is, well, if this turns out bad, we can just back out and pull ourselves out of these. Um, I'd like you to speak to, to that. At what point would it become appropriate for the state to back out, and, and then there's the other question, after you invested millions, how do you do it? Um, I think that's a great question, and honestly, some of my learning being on the school board of the 35th largest school district in the state is, that is not an easy thing to do. Um, we have 12,000 or 14,000 employees in Jefferson County. Uh, we're about a tenth of the state of Colorado, so I'll round and say maybe there are 140,000 public education employees in the state of Colorado. Turning that ship around is not an easy thing to do. So uh, I'm with you, and turning that around um, would not be easy. It, it wouldn't be easy today, to be honest, because Coloradans in most of our public schools have spent since 2010, when you guys voted to go that way, um, retraining our teachers, 
um, reorganizing what was delivered in what years. But there's a third stool of that um, triumvirate in my world that you didn't talk about. And I think that's the most important one. We've talked a little bit about standards. We've talked a little bit about assessments. To me, the most important piece of that is the curriculum. And Common Core State Standards, while guiding curriculum, doesn't determine curriculum. In Colorado, and this is different, there are a handful of states that have constitutionally given their local school boards local control over the, the, the curriculum, and Colorado is one of them. So for me, it's not so much about backing out of the standards. For me, it's more about a conversation of making sure our school boards are doing their job and what's the curriculum that we're going to deliver to make sure that we're meeting, at least, and hopefully exceeding, as in the case of Douglas County, who recently passed a resolution that said, basically, the Common Core State Standards are irrelevant in Douglas County because they've pegged their standards higher than the Common Core State Standards. And so I, I think your question is a really uh, thoughtful one that we need to be careful about because pulling out of that asks all of our school districts to turn a direction and without knowing what that new direction would be, I think that's a really difficult place to put school districts, to put school boards, and most importantly for me, to put us because that throws us in chaos for, I would suspect, probably the next decade where again, we can't compare how well our students are doing to other schools. And quite frankly, part of the reason the uh, teachers unions in the United States are against the Common Core State Standards, in my opinion, is because they want to do just that. They want to throw us in flux for the next 10 years so that we spend the next 10 years talking about what should the new set of standards be instead of figuring out how do we make our children more successful what systems do we need to put in place? And I agree, in Massachusetts and Colorado, they're going to be different. In Jefferson County, they're gonna be different on the east side of the county than they are gonna be on the west side of the county. So I think that's a really important conversation and I worry for the loudness of the conversation that states need to pull out of the Common Core State Standards and pull out of the assessments, um, those groups, um, because I think it puts us in a state of flux without, as we've heard all weekend, you have to have the new vision. If you can tell me where you'd prefer to go and what standards you'd prefer to have, I think that's a, a logical conversation. But without some new conversation to have and a way to measure that, and again, in Colorado, that's taken us a little over a decade to get there. Many other states, the same time frame. I, I think we need to tread very carefully. And I'll, I'll come back to my final analogy. Go ahead. Jim, there's, um, here in Colorado, there are some grumbling, probably not uh, enough to put a question in front of the legislature or, or the state board anytime soon about Colorado pulling out of Common Core and the park assessments. This discussion has become very relevant in Indiana as the leadership has changed. You got a new governor and a new, uh, 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 new superintendent. Uh, commission, uh, superintendent of yep. statewide superintendent of education. Michigan's having this discussion. Some states never went in, Texas being a, a good example. Uh, but for these states that are considering reversing direction on Common Core and consortium assessment strategies. Um, is, it, is it a function of, of just the merits of the debate or is there, there more to it? Yes, I think it's a great question. Um, if I could, just two very quick points. Uh, again, I'd just like to correct. The, the, the Common Core is not a floor though. It is verbatim 85%. That's what get test, that gets tested and that'll be in the classroom. The second thing is American Federation of Teachers headed up by Randy Weingarten is for Common Core they're only for putting off the test one year. The National Education Association, the largest teachers union in the country is for Common Core, has participated in their 21st Century Skills Task Force and many other things. So they're not against this. I don't disagree on the testing when it comes down to the test. They'll want to blow that up so they can't be tested and held accountable. I agree with that. Jim, Jim can, uh, yeah. forgive me, the, on, on this question, yeah. the, I think it's possible both of you may be right. I'd like you to speak to this and that, that is that it is, uh, it, it is instructed to states that they are to adopt these standards as a state, but that from a state perspective going to the districts, right. it is a minimum floor. So that the state, the state has, I guess, is, a, is mandated, if you, the, the state commits yep. to setting a minimum floor, but yep. um, what people down in Denver tell my school and my district and others is that this is the floor. You as a school should shoot higher. You should establish standards that are higher. Completely agree. I'm just saying that when the tests are put into place and the tests only test on what is part of Common Core, your teachers will not teach that because they will be evaluated in part on that. So um, 
So the, your question, though, your question, though, was about the reality of where we are now. Um, so you're part of PARC. Uh, PARC has had five states pull out of its assessment consortium over the past uh, four months. Um, I believe that includes Georgia uh, most recently. Uh, Mich Michigan has put on hold any implementation. Indiana has put everything on hold. As a result, the cost for PARC will continue to go up because there will be fewer students participating in that, fewer dollars flowing through, so it's going to become even more costly. I think that is the reason why legislators now, only now, are catching up with this conversation because the costs are now coming through. It might surprise you folks, but Common Core was advanced without a cost estimate. You know, uh, the first organization to do it was Pioneer Institute. We hired one of the, the most recognized cost gurus, assessment gurus in the country. He did analysis, he said basically about $16 billion. You might say that's worth it for the kids, right? You can make that judgment. Um, but again, I would make the judgment that it's for community college readiness and I'm not really willing to pay $16 billion for that. The second issue that is really cropping up all over the place, and this is something that speaks to moms, um, is if you look at Indiana, Utah, now Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, Georgia, um, the moms are organizing and that is something that flows back through constituency ser constituent services back to legislators where they're hearing, what? You're doing this? Speaker Shannon in Oklahoma uh, was, I think, tepidly for Common Core up until, I think, this past spring. Uh, and he said, I've never received more letters, more uh, Facebook messages from moms on any issue during my entire career. I'm against it now. Uh, I think that's what's happening, that people are catching up with the knowledge because moms are seeing the stuff that's coming home with their kids. And not all that's to blame, I'm not blaming Common Core for all that, okay? Because that is a curricular decision made in implementing Common Core, but Common Core has opened up the door to a lot weaker stuff, a lot of the constructivist stuff. You cannot blame Common Core for that. That's local officials, okay? So let's be honest about that. But Common Core certainly hasn't helped in that regard, has lowered the bar for many states, so it hasn't helped on that front either. So I think where we are right now is folks are facing over the next uh, couple months a couple things. More costs coming out at the local level, at the state level, where state legislators have to vote for a budget to fund this, right? California, part of the $6 billion tax increase is going to Common Core. Tony Bennett, who was the state superintendent in Indiana, moved to Florida after he lost election on Common Core, by the way. Got there, he was just fired, uh, resigned, excuse me. <coughs> um, <laughs> Um, because, in part because they realized they had $400 million additional cost to Florida because they had to implement Common Core. He said, no, 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 there won't be more costs. But yes, there are costs, folks. That's a big issue. The second thing is there are or, organizationally gra at the grassroots level, whether, whether it's the Eagle Forum, whether it's MOMS, whether it's all these different organizations called uh, Utahns against Common Core, Indians, uh, Hoosiers against Common Core. They're flowering. It is a very robust set of folks, and I think legislators are starting to feel that pinch as well. And that's related to content. So that, that's a, I, I, I'm gonna jump for a second. Being the mom of two children, a sophomore and a senior, and yes, I send them out to drive to a really lousy school every day. <laughs> is there a tall building I can jump off of? <laughs> One of the good things about the Common Core State Standards conversations is it is engaging our parents again. We've gone, about two decades, I think, with working families where mom's working and dad's working or the last couple of years somebody's unemployed and looking for a job. And I think on us again is our uh, reticence over the last two decades to watch what's happening in public schools. So one of the good things about the Common Core State Standards debate is it has woken up our moms um, and dads and grandmas and grandpas because they usually are the ones with the time on their hands. So grandmas and grandpas get involved in, as well. But I think a lot of that is the fear of the federal government being involved, and I think this room knows better than any other, we have to be ever vigilant if we're gonna keep our republic to the federal government getting involved. But my question to those moms is, what about the standards don't you like? And if you don't like something about the standards, elect a school board like we did in Douglas County who will raise the bar. It's not the base of the standards that mommies don't like. In some cases, it's that it's not high enough. Okay, that's fine. But I think we need to be very careful about which conversations we're having because while we're up here watching the stars and the sky is falling on Common Core State Standards, 
we're opening our castle doors to changes in curriculum, and that's where the battle should be fought, and to a national database called InBloom, which Jeffco is piloting as well as the state of Colorado, and, and that's another place where lots of states have pulled out. But your grandchildren's data is gonna be put in this national InBloom database funded by the Gates Family Foundation, and that's marching forward. We're all we're having this Common Core State Standards conversation. And I'm not saying we're not smart enough to have lots of different conversations, but make sure that you're having the right conversations and that you know what it is you're for or against and where to fight that. I, I wanna finish with my questions, and I've, 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 gone, I've gone over our uh, sch schedule here a little bit on, um, on this por portion. I think it's gone all right. Does everybody agree? Because <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna, after this, we'll uh, take some questions from the floor. And uh, that is on this question of curriculum, because that is, that is really the sacred ground in education. Our state constitution forbids your state legislators and the state government from establishing a curriculum. That is not the case in every state, by the way. So, so how this applies is, is a different question for the common core people, state to state. Uh, but there are many states, we being one, and, and it's enforced fairly well by our, our uh, courts, uh, that curriculum development belongs specifically and exclusively in the domain of state board members. Um, some say that if you are designing the standards and the test, the thing in the middle is the curriculum, and if you can define those well enough, that you have pretty well defined the curriculum as well. Um, but not everyone agrees with that assessment, and so I would like, Jim, you to start off on uh, uh, this, this question. I, and let me add one more thing. The Denver Post on Thursday morning opined on their uh, editorial page uh, in support of Common Core, basically saying, all right, people in Colorado, there's no debate here, just move forward, adopt them, embrace them, and, and, and stop whining. Um, and, 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 and said in the editorial that districts still control curriculum, so that's what's really important, and this uh, debate isn't so isn't so urgent as uh, uh, on that basis. So let's talk about the most important piece. How is curriculum affected by Common Core Standards, National Consortium Assessments? Is it still a free world for curriculum development? And I think the answer is um, a little muddied, but yes, it has certainly an impact. Uh, and I'd start by saying the following. If you listen to Common Core proponents themselves, they say it's game changing in terms of what it'll do for the curricula around the country. Well, okay, let's take them at face value to some extent, but let's go at a more granular level. Um, and what you're saying about Colorado is actually true of many states where districts have local control, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, all that sort of stuff. Um, first and foremost, the funding, the, the testing consortia that are de developing the tests, in their applications to the federal government for funding, about 300 and I think $50 million, they actually say we will develop Curricular materials and instructional practice guides explicitly say that. Go look at the applications yourselves. Okay, so will it have an impact? Sure, sure it will. Will it dictate? No. All right, but let's go a little bit further. Um, how many people are, are uh, proponents of ch school choice? Just a, how many of you actually have your kids in a school of choice? Thank you for doing what you're doing. All right. Indiana, little story. Um, the whole blow up over Common Core, how does it start? It starts with a woman named Heather Crossan, who's a mom of a kid in a Catholic school. Um, the Catholic school, uh, he's a fourth grader, uh, and he comes home with some really lousy math, and she starts saying, how can I change that? And the principal says, well, this is just wonderful stuff, you just don't understand it, Mrs. Crossan. He says, well, you know, I really don't like it. It's really kind of crazy stuff. It's very constructivist, I don't want to see it. Goes back, he says, no, I'm sorry, you can't, you have to go talk to a state representative. She talks to state representative, board of ed, on all the way up, and they say, well, we're part of Common Core, this is what we've adopted as part of Common Core. It's like, what do you call it, 1-800 number in DC to change it? Prior to the, uh, the voucher law that passed in Indiana, uh, Catholic schools could do whatever they wanted to do. But as part of the voucher law, they had to adopt state tests, which then were the national tests, okay? Now, what's the problem there? Catholic schools use norm reference tests, generally speaking, tests that are not attached to a sp specific curricular choice because they're used by a vast array of different schools of choice. 
You can't say that all schools will have the same curriculum. So you're trying to pick up things like aptitude, basic knowledge, analytic skills, that sort of thing. Common Core's tests are very different, folks. These are tests that are designed to drive curriculum. They are not norm reference tests. So is it clear they dictate what the curricula, the various curricula be? No, you cannot say that. But they certainly drive it in a specific direction. They make all kinds of choices about how much nonfiction, how much fiction, the kinds of nonfiction. Um, they make very specific choices about where algebra one is. Will you actually get to calculus? Where's trigonometry? They make a specific choice about how to teach geometry. All of us learned, you know, side angle side, Euclidean traditional geometry, get the, that little uh, uh, thing going in your head. I think you can remember it. Uh, <laughs> um, that's changed. There's an experimental approach that's never been uh, successfully used at the, uh, the K-12 level they're using. These are curricular choices, yeah. Is it across the board? No. So I don't want to overstate what it is, but yeah, it's a big impact. So I appreciate you being honest about where that line in the sand is drawn, because as we know in Colorado, Douglas County has raised the bar and truly treats Common Core state standards as a base. L LPR graduates, by the way. Lots County. of LPR graduates. Board. So <laughs> when those LPR graduates stood up before, I expect to see every one of your names on the ballot in 65 days, because truly this program does raise good school board members. But I think one of the interesting conversations in this free market crowd is, what kind of curriculum choices will we have in a world where I now know as an entrepreneur, I can write books and sell them across 50 states, where five years ago, if I wrote a textbook, I may not be able to sell it in more than one because I may not be able to convince any single school board to buy that book. Does it not open some entrepreneurial opportunities that give us some opportunities to have much broader curriculum choices in our free market environment now than we might have had before. So, I, I, no? Okay. <laughs> so free markets don't drive entrepreneurial opportunities? That's an interesting conversation in this group. Well, when you know what your standards are, I would pretend it absolutely is a free market. You still get to go to your school boards. Bob's telling me I have no, to no, behave. No, I'm, 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 you keep going. The floor's yours. Okay. <laughs> I think, it's an, I think it's a conversation worth having because lots of the entrepreneurs in the education space that I've met over the last four years are excited about the opportunities to write textbooks, to do blended learning, quite frankly, to be able to, wouldn't it be cool if every child across the United States had the opportunity to go to Liberty Commons because Bob could broadcast into all 50 states and there's some level of assurance in your local school boards that he's at least meeting the base of the Common Core State, standard, Common Core State Standards, so your school boards aren't wigging out. To me, the direction that we're going in public education, and with a senior I'm particularly interested in this conversation, uh, are colleges worth the investment? Um, shouldn't we be able to take some of the best practices in some of our schools across the nations and, and make that generally available to other students across the country? And I, and I would say thank you for being honest in where that line's actually drawn on curriculum. And I think this is an interesting piece of the conversation. Okay. Uh, the, in my opinion, the most important issue confronting our country is public education. And whenever I have been at gatherings like this and throw the microphone open to the floor, it is possible that people want to tell us about their school and where they send their kids and give us their opinion. So we're going to, there's a roving microphone. And I, my, my only request is that frame your question in the form of a question. There we go. <laughs> Okay. You mean I go, can't make a speech first, Bob? Is that it? <laughs> you know, it's been interesting to me in listening to this discussion, and I've listened to many over the years. We talk about education in terms of process and statistics. We don't talk in terms of educating students. I was fortunate enough after a 40-year business career to teach at the uh, business school at UNC. And I was appalled by the fact that here are college students without the ability, in a lot of cases, to get up on their feet and discuss and defend an issue or write about it in a way that is coherently understood by most people. 
So we're not educating people, we are passing them through a system. And this is something that hasn't gone on in the last 10 years, it's gone on for the last 60 years. So Mr. Corrins, the question is. <laughs> yeah. The question is, we've got to destroy the system that exists today and change the whole educational system. And that, and beginning with statistical measurements, in my opinion, is not a way to change the, the educational system. So, so if the answer was yes, would that satisfy you? I, mean, I think <laughs> it's about time that we looked at education as not as a process, but as a fundamental end to create an educated uh, citizenry. We haven't done that. Is Massachusetts trying to do something completely different? I graduated Boston English High School, so I'm familiar. <laughs> I'm familiar with Massachusetts. What All ideas, hail Mr. Corrins. What then. ideas do you have to change the educational process? Listen, I first would say uh, thank you for sponsoring the table and supporting Steamboat's work. Um, the second thing I would say is um, I will disagree with you on standardized tests. That, uh, in, in terms of they play a very important role, but they are the end of the pipe, and you're precisely right about that. And here's where I think Massachusetts does have an important role. But every state has to do it in a way that is right for them, and that is from our state constitution, John Adams in 1780 outlined that we must cherish, cherish public education and literature. All right, that is something unique to our culture, so to your point. Uh, we have strongly believed in setting up our standards that we would have people read the Odyssey, the Iliad. They will read Jane Eyre. They will read really high quality literature if they're African American, Asian American, or sort of Syrian Greek mix that I am and my kids are. Um, so we've, we've really focused on making sure they are human beings who can participate in our civic culture as well as ready for international competitiveness, which we always hear about. So I completely agree with you on that. Um, let me just take a couple other quick things if I could. In terms of when you, before going to question, you said public education is the number one issue. Folks, it is the number one issue. And we have ceded it to the Democrats. And we've allowed Common Core to separate us. We are for more school choice built around kids, what kids' specific needs are, and they're very different not having a one-size-fits-all so that school choice of any kind all leads to the same curriculum. That's what we're for. We are for measurement and accountability. And we're for lots of flexibility. That's what we're for. We're not for having the federal government tell us how to do it. We're not for a national curriculum. Finland has a national curriculum. It's the size of Massachusetts. Okay? Um, if you have a national curriculum or you don't have a national curriculum, national set of standards or not a national set of standards, internationally, it doesn't, there's no indication in the data that says you'll do better or worse. This is all a bunch of, a huge distraction, I believe. We should be working with stuff that Laura was talking about before, which is at the granular level, making sure kids are getting access to great, high quality liberal arts content. We're allowing for much more expansion of e-learning. Your program can be expanded. Hard decisions turning around schools, holding them accountable. This is separating us, folks. Well, and I, and I would say thank you for that, seriously. <laughs> um, if we, this is an opportunity for us to win the conversation. And I was in an interesting meeting in Denver, all the people that run for school board in Denver are Democrats. But some are reform Democrats and some are not reform Democrats. And I was in a meeting of Republicans where one of the reform Democrats was asking for our support and he said this. So this is the Democrats telling us this. Republicans have always led the conversations about making public schools better. We lead in voucher conversations, we lead in choice conversations, we lead in getting rid of teacher tenure conversations, we lead in getting rid of union control conversations. Republicans have always led. And we can do it in a way that both sides understand because we understand the measurements and the goals and the objectives and the process, but we can say it in a way, what's fair? How do we give the underdogs their chance? Public education allows us, if we choose to, to come together and as Jim just said, have those underdog conversations, have those fairness conversations, which opens the tents and brings everybody together, Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliateds, and allows us to control the conversation and really move it forward if we'll stay together. 
So we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. The microphone is right there. Hi, thank you for uh, coming. Um, my question is based sort of back to your uh, statement of uh, free market and how this is geared towards that. Um, so, I mean, with me, it sounds more like this is crony capitalism in that we're going to set up a government program to initiate a free market system of choice and whatnot. When at the end of the day, why is this de debate not geared more towards private testing from private companies that would seem to have more of an incentive to keep their standards inc incredibly high? so that schools can gauge off of that as opposed to a government program that in the future, like you said, it's at the whim of each elected council and why would they not tweak the tests down to make their children or make the entire state's children look better when a state could, or when a private company could very well do a much better job at that. You know what, I think that's a great conversation and to um, Congressman, Schaefer's point before, our legislature in Colorado did require the State Board of Education to, to make a choice, but only for one year. So I actually have some acquaintances on the State Board of Education, and I think one of the th conversations that's better to have in Colorado is maybe Colorado needs to go to Iowa Basics. Maybe we need to pull out of park and go to an Iowa Basics. I don't know how well, that would, how well we would do. We'd have to norm that. And I believe that your local school board, because we have local control, could say, if you had the right school board, again, Douglas County's going in this direction, we're more interested in what our PISA and TIMS tests are than we are in what our park test scores are. And if you can have that literate conversation with your community and get enough of your business people to give enough money, because in general, unions buy school board races. So if your business people are on board with this and running the right candidates who can have those conversations, I think that's an absolutely great point. Different from the entrepreneurialism of the curriculum, but I think that's an absolutely great point. So Jim, let me ask you to respond. I get, we got to engineer a six minute stop here. So let me ask you to respond to that question and fold in some closing remarks and then I'll let Laura have the last word and we'll, we'll finish at 1045. Uh, absolutely. Uh, free markets does not mean one standard across all, all states. Uh, that's, um, that is, those are very different conversations. If a vendor cannot come and uh, customize a product for Massachusetts stu students, I'm not interested in that, that vendor. You have to have flexibility and creativity to do that sort of thing. Uh, so it can actually pass a sort of difficulty. There are difficulty analyses you can do for all kinds of tests to make sure that different states are at, at comparable levels. That's easy to do. But if a, if a vendor comes to me and says, I can't do a test for you, Massachusetts, because guess what? I need all of New England, and guess, I also need the West Coast. That seems to me baking in only the largest assessment companies who will buy their way into the process. And in fact, the largest testing companies, Pearson and others, are very, very much supportive of Common Core because they want to have one national market. They don't want to have to deal with parents and teachers and all that sort of stuff. And while that is sometimes, I think, you know, those are hard discussions to have, uh, I am very protective of our kids. I do believe if it's public education that we have to have a place where there's accountability to those people who are actually doing the work. And that means people who are elected and appointed within Massachusetts. Um, look, I don't have any closing remarks besides saying the following. Public education is the number one issue that we are facing. Do not buy in a bottle reform, whether it's from the federal government or from, frankly, Jeb Bush, his Florida approach to, uh, to education reform. You, as a state, have to do the hard work and deliberate and engage. Have the conversations to craft your own way. You are a lab of innovation. You have shown in the past the ability to create good standards. You also need to create good tests. You need more choice. Those are the things to fight for. And frankly, if you get diverted with all this stuff on Common Core and implementation and processes and processes and processes around Common Core, you're diverting lots of attention from expanding the number of schools that are like yours. Look, Massachusetts has done pretty well in public education. The reason I say is this simple reason. Massachusetts public education has done pretty well vis-a-vis um, -vis the rest of the country. Our charter schools have implemented all of the reforms we put into place that many of our district schools have not wanted to. And guess what the result is? Stanford University uh, is not a great friend to charter schools nor an enemy. They're very much a, a, an objective arbiter. And they came out with a report in March that said, Massachusetts charter schools, those choice schools, are the very best charter schools in the entire country. Take this back home with you in terms of what your schools can do. Our Boston charter schools, in nine months, the academic year, provide an additional 13 months of learning in math 
an additional 12 months of learning in English language arts. That is what is possible through choice and modest, though important work at the state level on standards. Going to Common Core and diverting attention is a problem, but also setting a weaker set of standards for our charter schools as well is a big problem. When all of school choice leads to the same curriculum, I think we're doing a disservice to one of our key platforms, which is school choice. Laura Boggs, you get the closing remarks. Um, I would agree that our efforts and energies need to be spent somewhere other than Common Core State Standards. That being said, I want to thank the Steamboat Institute for putting this on the agenda. This is not an easy conversation to have. You each need to finish up, go upstairs, look in your mirror or look in your rear view mirror and understand that if you personally don't get involved in this conversation, no one else will. I would never have imagined I could be the little puppy on this stage four years ago. I was just a pissed off mom. So. I love pissed off moms. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it takes. <laughs> oh, who had the good fortune to be mentored by some great people. So whether it's my good friend Donna, who I expect to get an email from saying she's running for the, state, for the Board of Education in Texas, or any one of you in here, especially in Colorado, those applications for Board of Education people are due in the next week. By this Friday, you have to have picked up your petition and gotten at least 50 validated or 25 in smaller school districts. So I'm going to close by asking you to do this. Please do more than just be part of, part of this conversation. I'm going to ask you to think about doing one of three things or all three. Number one, run for your school board, whether that's local or state. If we don't take this back, we lose this country. Number two, donate cash or time to somebody who is. Because in most cases, your unions are spending lots of money to make sure that you are not part of this conversation. And number three, advance this conversation of choice. Get out of the cognitive dissonance that we all have about where we're sending our children. Ask God for his forgiveness, if that's your mode, that you're sending your children into this cesspool of public education. <laughs> oh my God, my friends are going to love me. Yeah. <laughs> but be real about where we are and advocate for the choices, because only in a free market will we force the ability to give parents the opportunity to send their child to a school that works no matter what their zip code is. Thank you, to the, uh, thank you to the Steamboat Institute for bringing Laura Boggs and Jim Sturgios here together. This is a, a great debate, and we're adjourned. <laughs>